It's Thursday, April 30th, and this is now on HNN. Anything is like a ghost town, and it's like really sad. From Sin City to silence, the Ninth Island is facing a crushing struggle because of the pandemic. What can you do? Here at home, Governor Ige outlines plans to slowly reopen the local economy. Your hard work, sacrifices, and diligence is paying off. The mother of an infected Hawaii sailor criticizes the Navy's coronavirus response. He was tested and he tested negative at first and was put in a shared room with someone who tested positive. He's known as Captain Tom and here in the UK, he's become a bit of a hero. I'm Ian Lee with why the country is celebrating the World War II veteran. This is a celebration. Plus, the elderly Makiki woman who beat her grim diagnosis coming up on This Is Now. Aloha and good afternoon everyone, Ashley and Jonathan here and thank you for watching This Is Now. The state health department is reporting just five new COVID-19 cases today, bringing the statewide total to 618 cases. Of the new cases, three are on the Big Island, one is on Maui and one is a Hawaii resident, but they were diagnosed out of state. Meanwhile, the state is taking some small steps towards reopening. The governor says that will happen in a phased fashion, but perhaps slower than many wanted to. Chelsea Davis reports. Many are anxious to get back to business, but the governor cautioned against celebrating too soon. Ige warned, until there's a vaccine, this is our new normal. Seven-year-old Kale Luke has been taking piano lessons virtually for more than a month now. His piano teacher, Sharon Takara, has been teaching students via FaceTime since the stay-at-home order went into effect. She's eager for in-person lessons to resume, but is reluctant to start too soon. Initially, I was glad, and, and yet I don't feel I'm tentative to. I'm kind of hesitant to just have them just jump right back in. I think... Um, I'm going to wait at least till May 15th and decide. Our inventories are bulging at the seams. Another business with the green light? Car dealerships. The general manager at Cutter Volvo says some staff will return this week. They will offer solo test drives because of social distancing. More work will be done over the computer and phone, and they will be cleaning cars and surfaces constantly. It's going to be a little different buying environment for sure. This is now going to be part of our normal work uniform, wearing a mask every day. Many businesses reopening may also see a drop in customers due to unemployment. So they're hoping to entice buyers any way they can. Zero percent, in some cases out to 84 months. Uh, deferred payments, uh, 90 to 120 days. Rebate programs, lease programs. There's all kinds of things. If you're a consumer and you're in the market for a car right now, I, there's never been a better time to come out and look at a car, I can tell you. Some real estate services are also allowed. Realtor Judy Sobin says she's been getting lots of requests from folks wanting to buy homes. We'll have open houses that are by appointment. So we won't have more than one couple in at a time. And we'll have cleanser for them if they would like to clean their hands before and after open houses and I'll have extra masks there in case they in case they don't have anything. The governor says he may reinstate mandates if there is a surge in infections. Chelsea Davis, Hawaii News Now. Meanwhile, Hawaii authorities arrested four more visitors for violating the 14-day quarantine. Hotel staff in Waikiki called police Tuesday when they spotted Mitchell Shire of Florida and Anne Rush of Illinois returning to their room with takeout food and shopping bags. HPD also arrested Leif Johansson of California as he was loading groceries into his vehicle at Costco. Investigators say he also went jet skiing when he was supposed to be in quarantine in Waialua. And a fourth person was arrested on Maui. William Lafeer was seen leaving his hotel room twice. He's now voluntarily returning to Texas. You know, federal social distancing guidelines expire today, and states across the country are having to decide what they're going to do now. So Michael George has a wrap-up of what's happening on the mainland. Let's check in with him. Oh. 
Protesters in Michigan gathered at the state capitol Thursday to demand the governor drop stay-at-home orders. We need to get out and live our lives and quit taking our economy deep into socialism. In New York, state and city officials took unprecedented action, suspending subway service at night starting next week for cleaning. Every rail, every pole, every door, everything that people could be touching. It is a massive undertaking that we've never done before. In the last 24 hours, at least 306 New Yorkers died of the coronavirus. But hospitalizations are on the decline in the state. The Navy hospital ship Comfort left Manhattan Thursday, a month after arriving to help in the fight. The Comfort only saw 182 patients during its month-long stay in New York. And many of the state's other field hospitals, including this one here at the Javits Convention Center, have gone largely unused. This one closes tomorrow. Federal social distancing guidelines expire at midnight, but many states are already set to reopen some businesses Friday, including Arizona, Iowa, and Texas. It's almost like opening new restaurants. We've got lots of different protocols we're putting in place. But California's governor is temporarily closing state and local beaches in Orange County again, following crowded beach scenes from last weekend. We want you to uh, enjoy, uh, again, activities outdoors. Uh, again, the only thing we don't want you to do is linger outdoors in ways where you're mixing or you're congregating. And in Illinois, beginning Friday, residents will also be required to wear masks in most public spaces. Michael George, CBS News, New York. To Wall Street now, U.S. stocks finished the last trading day of the month in negative territory. The Dow closed 1.2% or 288 points lower. But despite the pessimistic economic data showing the disruption the pandemic is causing the economy, it was a historically good month for stocks. The Dow climbed 11.1%. It was the best monthly gain since January 1987. And President Donald Trump said he's anticipating a major economic rebound in the coming months and a quote spectacular 2021. Well I think we're going to have a great third quarter it's going to be a transition so when I say great I think the transition is going to be really terrific and we're going to take it into the fourth and I think we're going to have potentially a great fourth quarter. There's tremendous pent-up demand I don't know if Kevin said that or Larry Kudlow uh, but uh, they're telling they see it but I feel it I feel it I think sometimes what I feel is better than what I think unfortunately or fortunately, Phil. But I tell you what, I feel it. And I will say that I think next year is going to be a, a spectacular year in terms of growth, in terms of bringing our country back. I think we're going to have a really good year. We want to be where we were. And I think we can actually surpass where we were. And we were the strongest anywhere in the world. We were the best that we ever were, but we were the strongest anywhere in the world. As President Trump speaking this morning. You know, from Sin City to silence, experts say Las Vegas has really been one of the hardest hit areas of the country. We have Kyung Law, who's reporting from Las Vegas, and filed this report. Las Vegas, as we've never seen or heard before. The entire Vegas Strip shut down. 100% of casino doors closed. Tourists gone. Emptiness is like a ghost town and it's like really sad. It's why Alicia Garcia and so many other laid off casino workers are in this line. Miles of cars, hundreds of families wait outside the Boulder Station Casino. They're not here for work, but for free food from the food bank. I never see myself to do this before. I never see myself to do this before, but what can you do? A cancer survivor, Marcella Merriweather had a great union job at the MGM Casino just weeks ago. I said before that I'm not going to go over there because maybe there's somebody else that somebody needs that. And then now I have to do it. I haven't got any unemployment. Guess what? The face of hunger in Las Vegas today looks like you and me. Over half the folks have never been in a line like this asking for help. These are regular people who are working solid middle class jobs and their lives just capsized overnight. Are you saying this is ground zero for the economic damage? I'm not saying that. I know that this is ground zero. The lights have essentially shut off on Nevada's economy, one based on tourism and leisure. No tourists, no entertainment making coronavirus a bigger blow to Vegas than the 2008 financial crisis. We're talking that this is worse because 
At that time, at least we had some occupancy within the hotels. The chairwoman of the Clark County Commission, which governs the Strip, says key now how casinos reopen. I'd rather open slow and methodical. I don't think that anybody wants to close a second time. Casinos have begun rolling out reopen plans. The Venetian and Wynn Casino say guests will see new cleaning measures like thermal cameras, electrostatic sprayers using hospital-grade disinfectant, and UV lights for disinfection. Luxury driver Jimmy Pryor expects under that new normal, the economy will at best crawl back. He drove up to the food bank in his Hummer. It's what he used to drive Vegas visitors around. COVID changed life like a switch. It's scary, you know, that you make you realize, you know, what you used to have and now you don't have it, right? Those are some really startling images there, considering how many connections people have here to the mm -hmm. Ninth Island. And to see that line of people waiting for food outside this casino is just heartbreaking. And the cost of living in Vegas is really low compared to here, so those people must really be struggling. Yeah, totally, just jobs wiped out just mm -hmm. like that. All right, and then those precautions are going to be taken are very really interesting too, and you would think some of those would have implications here too, so we'll have to see how that all Absolutely. unfolds. All right. Meanwhile, the largest maritime exercise in the world will be heading will be held in August off Hawaii. All RIMPAC participants will have to stay out at sea. There won't be any amphibious onshore exercises. Now, the Navy says this is to minimize the footprint at Pearl Harbor during the ongoing pandemic. The event is usually held from June to August with about two dozen countries participating and thousands of personnel in Hawaii. Meanwhile, the Navy has ordered yet another investigation into the outbreak aboard the USS Theodore Roosevelt, and families of infected sailors are calling for more answers on how the Navy handled the situation. Our Rick Daysog spoke to the mother of a local sailor still in quarantine. 21-year-old Jacob Opunui of Maui is among the 940 crew members aboard the USS Theodore Roosevelt infected by the coronavirus. His mother, Robin Rodriguez, says the Navy may have increased his chances of infection when it removed him and his fellow crew members from the ship in late March. He was tested, and he tested negative at first and was put in a shared room with someone who tested positive. He later developed flu-like symptoms, and it was a really ugly eight days where we were just extremely concerned about his health. He still has minor symptoms. Rodriguez is among the many relatives of crew members who are questioning the Navy's handling of the pandemic. They're also critical of the Navy's controversial firing of its Captain Brett Crozier, who sounded the alarm about the disease. He had an organized plan and made the plea for them to return home after Vietnam when our sailors started getting sick. The ship's current command, however, says sailors were not put in harm's way. Quote, sailors who tested positive were isolated from those who tested negative. Sailors who tested positive and sailors who tested negative were never combined in off-ship lodging. Rodriguez says her son is now quarantined in a basketball gym in Guam with 100 sick crew members. They're next to each other. They are three to four feet apart, crammed on cot. They are all together. She says her son, a 2016 Lahaina Luna graduate, hasn't held his month-and-a-half-year-old baby yet. He was supposed to return home to Maui for his birth. Our sons and daughters signed up to serve our country, and you feel like it's a failure when your country can't serve your son or daughter. Rick Daysog, Hawaii News Now. U.S. intelligence agencies are debunking a conspiracy theory saying they have concluded that the new coronavirus was not man-made or genetically modified. But they say they are still examining a notion put forward by the president and his aides that the pandemic may have resulted from an accident at a Chinese lab. That statement came today from the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, the clearinghouse for the web of U.S. spy agencies. Now, it comes as the president and his allies have touted the un- proven theory that an infectious disease lab in Wuhan, the epicenter of the Chinese outbreak, was the source of the global pandemic. All right, the number of those who are losing their jobs continues to increase. Mm -hmm. It's hoped that businesses can put some of those employees back to work with the help of federal loans, but some of those companies saying they don't even know if they want the money. Nancy Chin reports. Anna's Bananas Daycare in Minnesota had to let workers go when the coronavirus hit and parents kept their kids home. My unemployment um, mail stack of mail was 
very high. 3.8 million Americans applied for unemployment benefits last week. The number of weekly filings is slowing down from the historic 6.9 million at the end of March, but the total for six weeks of job losses is now more than 30 million. It's hoped the numbers will improve now that small businesses can access a second round of funding from the Paycheck Protection Program, or PPP. Anna's Bananas got one of those loans to pay employees for eight weeks. We have all of our employees that came back to work full time. On one day, I had to put on furlough of 480 people, uh, which was really terrible. Lori Hamill owns health clubs in three states. He also applied for a PPP loan, but now isn't sure he can use it to pay employees. You've got to spend 75% of the money we give you on payroll during the next eight weeks. And I'm like, well, what if we're not open? He's worried if his clubs are still shut down in eight weeks, he'd have to lay off people again. He also says many of his workers would rather collect unemployment for now because the federal government added $600 a week to state funds. The reality is, is that our staff members are making more money on unemployment than I am paying them. So they don't really even want to be paid by me. Like much of this pandemic, there are plenty of questions with no easy answers. Nancy Chen, CBS News, New York. Back here at home, the state has a new website for independent contractors and self-employed workers to file for unemployment benefits. It's pua.hawaii.gov. That's P-U-A. PUA stands for Pandemic Unemployment Assistance. Its application system is similar to unemployment insurance, but it's said to be easier to use. Meanwhile, an Oahu skydiving company has been taking reservations for flights this weekend at Dillingham Airfield. But HPD is warning customers they could be cited or even arrested. Our Stephanie Lum has both sides. Skydive Hawaii made the announcement on social media and it's received a backlash from some in the community. Skydive Hawaii repeatedly said on Facebook this week, we will reopen for tandems beginning May 2nd. The company says it will require face masks and check temperatures and blood oxygen levels of those participating. Um, it was upsetting. Miley Rogers is one of the founders of Facebook group My Hele Mai, a branch off of Hawaii quarantine kapu breakers. My Hele Mai. My Hele Mai o koi Hawaii ke ia manava. Don't visit Hawaii at this time. She says people with her group have been posing as tourists, booking jumps online to investigate why Skydive Hawaii is operating. I feel like they're putting people over profit. I feel like it's really premature. Uh, we haven't, we may have flattened the curve and slowed it down, but we haven't eradicated it yet. So it's still a possibility to infect more people, which will affect obviously more families. In a statement, Frank Hinshaw of Skydive Hawaii says, we are under FAA jurisdiction, not state or city. Our airport is open and planes are using it. Aviation is essential and our business is conducted under the provisions of FAR Part 105, a federal law governing skydiving. But the Honolulu Police Department says, flight instruction and tandem skydiving are non-essential under the governor's sixth supplemental proclamation, and violators are subject to warning citation or arrest. Oh, we asked the FAA who's right, but a spokesperson only provided a vague answer saying the authority lies with whoever has jurisdiction over the airport. The military actually owns the land, but says the state transportation department has jurisdiction. So far, the state has failed to clarify the matter. Rogers understands why Hinshaw wants to start flying again, but says it's just not the time. It, like I said, it's upsetting because we all want to get back to work. We all want to enjoy the beaches. We all want to enjoy the resources that are out there for us. And we can't because of this pandemic. So if we need to be responsible, so does everyone else. Hinshaw tells us he believes HPD is misstating the governor's emergency order, but he's speaking with his attorney to determine if he'll restart on Saturday. Stephanie Lum, Hawaii News Now. All right, we'll definitely follow up to see how that all goes out in the next couple of days. We're going to move on to our checking in segment now. Today we're talking to a botanical boutique order owner, co-owner. She owns Pico in Kaka'ako, Courtney Monahan, and she explains how they've been going through this whole shutdown and they've had some ups and downs with were flowers going to be mm -hmm. allowed to, to be delivered for Mother's Day, were they not? And then this week we learned they were. So I talked to her shortly after she found out. First off, tell us about Pico. What is Pico? If you haven't heard of it, it's in the heart of Kaka'ako. What is it? 
Kaiko is a botanical boutique. We've been in Kakiako since the beginning, about seven years, and we have um, flowers. So we, we specialize in mostly local flowers, working with local farms, a lot of small local farms. Um, we do arrangements. Um, we have a brick and mortar shop, so you can come in and get stems. You can get an arrangement, you can get plants, and I do it all. We do workshops. Right, you just said arrangements, and I have the paper right here from this week. You guys had some ups and downs this week, right? Or the last couple weeks with wondering if you could, Mother's Day is a big day. You're wondering if you could even deliver flowers. What was that like? Um, I think we were just kind of trying to stay level-headed and figure out figure out the best way to move forward. Um, when we got word that we could open, we, we put our arrangements up right away. And have, we work with small farms, so we were just holding our breath and hoping that it would be reversed so that we could um, we could still buy. Let's hit on those local farmers too. What, how have they been dealing with all this, the shutdown, your conversations with them? We got a picture from a farmer on Big Island who grows proteas, I'm sorry, on Maui, of just all of his beheaded flowers. Mm. Like, just having to throw away all these flowers. From me talking to people, I've talked to bar owners, shop owners, and everyone sort of has a trickle-down effect. Other than the farmers, what are you seeing economically from your side of the biz world? You know, we have a couple different styles of farmers that we work with. Um, we, two of our farmers are, you know, retired um, people, on big, one on Big Island and one on Maui, and this is their way of life now, but they are retired, and What's nice is that both of them reached out to us immediately and, and told us how much they appreciated us and they forgave the unpaid bills that we had for them. Um, which brings me to tears to even say, but they know that we're good for it and we've been working with them for, you know, eight years. Uh, but then there's other farmers, some here locally, that it's their way of life and they've lost all of their income right now so you know with Watanabe closed with Baratania with all of these different um, flower shops closed and with no events happening and probably not happening for a while in a way um, the flower industry is going to take a while especially the event portion. Courtney thanks for checking in with us I can't wait to check out the new shop in Kaimoki coming soon any open date yet? Be open when we open <laughs> All right, Courtney there. I don't know if you noticed, she actually had her hands were covered in teal paint and she was in front of that teal wall. That's the new shop. Oh, cool. Um, it's right there in Kaimuki. Uh, it's opening soon. She didn't know the exact date yet, but it's. I love their shop in Kakoko. It's I've been there fantastic. many times. So it's, it's very cute. fascinating that they didn't just stop. They're like, we're going to keep going with our plans. We're not going to let this hold us back. We're going to still open our new, new shop there. Mm -hmm. So. All right, time for some good news, folks. Some good medicine, all the stories of the day that's positive out there. We will begin with a recovery story. A Makiki woman who spent three weeks in a hospital with COVID-19 says doctors only gave her a 10% chance of survival. 78-year-old Glenda Tucker beat the odds and was discharged from Tripler on Saturday. Now she tells us she doesn't know how she got the virus and her only symptom was extreme nausea. She was on a ventilator for eight Eight days before her triumphant release. And we have some sound from her. Let's play it out for you guys. Here's what she had to say. Cheering and yelling and they gave me lays and uh, cards and pictures and just, I mean, it was just a celebration and my, my whole ICU team was there. Um, when you've been lying down for three weeks filled with pills and shots and blood taken out of you and constant, you know, care. Um, it's just nice to be home. Tucker says doctors gave her anti-malaria drugs and had her lay on her stomach to relieve the pressure on her lungs. All right, this next story I've been waiting for this whole newscast, an update on Captain Tom, the World War II veteran in the UK is celebrating his 100th birthday. He recently made some international headlines for his fundraising efforts. Ian Lee brings us his story. He wants to be known as just Captain Tom, but he's much more than that. 
The British World War II veteran stepped onto the world stage with a charity walk around his garden, raising over $40 million to support healthcare workers in Britain. His original goal was just 1200 I think it's absolutely <laughs> fantastic sum of money. You would never imagine that sort of money. So for his 100th birthday today, a grateful nation said thank you. He received a birthday card from the Queen and a special message from the Prime Minister. So on behalf of the whole country, thank you and have a very special 100th birthday. The Royal Air Force gave him a royal salute with two vintage World War II fighters. I'm one of the few people here who have seen a, a hurricane and fleet fires flying past in anger. Fortunately today, they're all flying peacefully. Tom also received thousands of birthday cards from around the globe, filling the gymnasium at his grandson's school. So we've had cards from two-year-olds and we've had cards from 92-year-olds, and, and that's been pretty special as well. And to cap off the day, the Queen promoted Captain Tom to Colonel, a man truly proving why he's part of the greatest generation. Thank you. Yes, yes, thank you very much. Ian Lee, CBS News, London. Colonel Tom. I love him so much. One of my... Just most inspiring stories of this whole ordeal has been that one for me. Mm -hmm. It just really hits me. And good to see that he's getting more recognition. Mm -hmm. And all those cards are just a good visualization. And of how a much birthday respect. card from the Queen. Yeah, seriously. You would have a heart attack. Freak out all the way. <laughs> All right, we got some more good news, folks. Let's get to it. Disney is selling reusable cloth face masks with some of your favorite Cute. characters for charity. Now, the non-medical reusable masks feature characters from across Disney's companies, from Mickey Mouse to Marvel, Pixar, and to Star Wars. A four-pack sells for about 20 bucks and is available in three sizes. Disney will donate up to a million dollars in profits from the masks to MedShare now through September 30th, and the company also plans to donate one million masks for children and families in underserved and vulnerable co uh, communities across the country. Pretty adorable masks mm -hmm. there too. I would choose Marvel, and I would love the Hulk one. Oh yeah, that's, that's pretty what cool. I was gonna pick too. Matches my normal face, so. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't even be able to tell the difference. Got more Star Wars news. Okay. And this one I'm a little bitter about, folks, because Star Wars Rise of Skywalker will begin streaming in two months early on Disney+. Plus. That's for May the 4th, Star Wars Day. Mm -hmm. May the 4th be with you. They intended to, like... Uh, adhere to their normal guidelines of having seven months between when it was in theaters and when it goes on streaming service and that's what I was thinking because I bought it this weekend for four ninety nine. <laughs> so I could have just waited a few more days and I liked it. It was really good actually. I a lot of people didn't like the movie. I, I, I thought it was pretty good. Uh -huh. Um the, the pandemic has changed all this. They decided to release it early. They're also going to release a documentary on the making of The Mandalorian that also comes out on Star Wars Day. So cool. I'm very, I'm very behind on Star Wars. Oh, very really? Behind. Which was yeah. the last one you... Have you watched Mandalorian yet still? Nope. Wow. Mm -hmm. As much as we talked that up on this I know. Now, I've seen all the old ones. I've seen the one with Jar Jar Binks and then maybe one or two oh, more. Jar Jar, that's not good. I know. Yeah. That one was... That's yeah, not Yeah, I think that kind of put me in a slump. Yeah. That's going <laughs> to do it for us today on This Is Now. Um... Enjoy Disney Plus if you have it out there, guys. <laughs> and we'll be back here tomorrow. No official press conference is planned for the rest of the afternoon yet. But if it does happen, we'll be sure to let you know on a push alert. But there's still a lot of developments happening throughout the day. So watch H&N today at 5 on KHNL and KGMB. Stay safe, everyone.